Well, hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Uh, I would like once again to thank our sponsor, Seda, for making all this possible and everybody who helped also make this event uh, a reality. So uh, let's start by introducing Professor Andrew Brewerton. Uh, some reflections on the space of learning. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, Olaf Teres. Uh, let me see, how do I click my presentation to view? Here it is. And there it is. OK. So you've all disappeared now, but thanks so much, um, Lefteris, for your kind invitation to speak here today. And, and on behalf of all of us here, thank you for designing and organizing this third virtual design education forum. It's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Thank, thank you, Andrew. OK, so I'll aim to speak for about 30 minutes and we have time for questions then. Our overarching theme <clears throat> is creativity without a computer, education in the age of AI. And my talk this morning entitled Some Reflections on the Space of Learning builds upon two propositions in Plymouth College of Arts 10 point manifesto for creative learning and social justice that I discussed with uh, Lef Terris in a recent Design Talks uh, podcast. These are, respectively, that the space of learning offers or withdraws the possibility of learning, and that space cannot contain energy, it is energy that creates space. The image you <clears throat> see here shows the studio of a friend, the late British abstract expressionist painter Albert Irvin. In my presentation, I'd like to explore the studio as a very distinctive kind of learning space, a habitat or environment that has evolved continually over centuries and across cultures and continues to evolve in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and in our age of artificial intelligence, <coughs> so-called, <coughs> excuse me. But wait, uh, not so fast. We may already be in danger of making too many assumptions here. Assumptions, for example, regarding the nature of artifice, of technology, or of human understanding and computational machine intelligence, or of what it is indeed that constitutes space or learning. All significant terms of reference that may help situate our purposeful regard for the development of creative practice, both inside and outside the studio or the academy. Assumptions also regarding the language we use to represent or to make our ideas. To begin with, therefore, with a simple, uh, though by no means easy, question. What exactly is space? Well, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the English word space is first recorded at the end of the 12th century common era as a loan word borrowed from 12th century Norman French originally indicating a period or duration in time, especially free time, deferment or delay. By 1300, the word had acquired physical connotations of geographic distance, surface area, or extent. What space is, therefore, first and foremost, is an English word. That is to say a term or signifier within human language that is itself a human artifact, a complex and deeply layered abstraction encrypting long human histories. You might say an instrumental technology. Language is very literally the distinctive signature of our species. And as such, arguably, our first form of artificial intelligence. 
an instrument not only of communication, but of radical and abstract invention. To forget or overlook this would be to enter a state of illusion. Or, as Georges Braque put it in his Cahier, his notebook of 1917 to 47, an, an amazing x ray into uh, 20th century modernism, by the way. Écrire n'est pas décrire. Peindre n'est pas dépeindre. La vraisemblance n'est que ton deuil. To write is not to describe. To paint is not to depict. Realism is mere illusion. In a digital age, we use the word technology as syn synonymous with kit or equipment, such as smartphones or computers, such is our obsession with things. But etymologically speaking, technology is a word we derive from the Latin technologia and from Hellenistic Greek words techne, signifying art, skill or craft, and logos, signifying knowledge or understanding through word, discourse and reason. <coughs> Excuse me. In its first use in 17th century English, technology referred to the branch of knowledge dealing with the mechanical arts and applied sciences and to discourse on practical art and craft. I want to promote this sense of language as this kind of material, as an intricate, deeply layered and living human artifact. A place and place emphasis on technology, not as stuff, but as know-how and as poiesis or making, as in these terms, a critical dimension of the studio as a space of creative learning and practice. What then, and where indeed, is the studio as the natural environment of art practice and learning today, in the extended wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and in an age of AI, both significant markers at this point in the era we now call the Anthropocene? The English noun studio is a loan word from the Italian, the Italian word is studio, and has evolved in both languages to mean both a room used for studying and the workroom of an artist, photographer, filmmaker, musician, etc. In the study, study is at the same time both a physical space defined by its practical use and a mental space uh, defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as a state of contemplation or musing, a state of mental abstraction, a reverie. The studio is something more than a library or a reading room, however, it is a making space in which making is a kind of thinking and thinking a kind of making process. I would argue that the conceptual dimension of art and design practice is not theory, but poetics, from the classical Greek verb poiein, to make. In the context of space, language is also a form of human dwelling or occupation. Space is something we occupy by design and is therefore in itself a human artifact, the product of human imagination and purposeful, imposing and structural energy, often at variance with the natural world. As the American poet Wallace Stevens wrote in his poem, Anecdote of the Jar, from his 1923 publication, Harmonium. 
I placed a jar in Tennessee, and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground and tall and of a port in air. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was grey and bare. It did not give of bird or bush like nothing else in Tennessee. Um, this slide shows the Dominion Wide Math Special. It's a glass packaging project, a, a product that may have been translated into Stephen's poem, a glass container vessel. Space cannot contain energy. It is energy that creates space. While in terms of architectural design, uh, his book, How Buildings Learn, is rather light on educational institutions, Stuart Brand notes as much with regard to the expanded sense of the word domus, meaning house, in classical Greece and Rome. He says this, people and their dwellings were indistinguishable. Domus referred not only to the walls, but also to the people within them. Evidence for this is found in inscriptions and text in which the word refers now to one, now to the other, but most often to both at once, to the house and its residents envisioned as an indivisible whole. The architectural setting was not an inert vessel. You know, we talk about the house of Windsor, don't we? Uh, the house of Atreus. Uh, and it's that's not referring to bricks and mortar. By sharp contrast, Stuart Brand writes, institutional buildings act as if they were designed specifically to prevent change for the organization inside and to convey timeless reliability to everyone outside. When forced to change anyway, as they always are, they do so with expensive reluctance and all possible delay. Institutional buildings are mortified by change. And this is a far cry from Richard Rogers' statement, the architect of Sir Richard Rogers' statement. One of the things that we're searching for is a form of architecture which, unlike classical architecture, is not perfect and finite on completion. We're looking for an architecture rather like some music and poetry which can actually be changed by the users, an architecture of improvisation. From a learner perspective, movement and flux, adaptive design and use prove core structural uh, principles for educational environments, arguably for the studio, especially those where in pedagogical terms, making is considered as important as reading and writing. In human dwelling or occupation of our mental and physical worlds, the word space is thus a proximal signifier, qualified by usage and often with other terms. Moving outwards, we speak of headspace, of interior, exterior and outer space, and of space-time. Dwelling creates this powerful dynamic of inside and outside, not simply in terms of physical seclusion, but also as a perceptual and imaginal perspective and dimension. I don't have to leave the studio to be in the landscape, as my friend Shui Guangchun, the uh, 
the Henan-based uh, Shan Shui, Chinese landscape painter, put it. The dialectic of inside and outside was never simple binary exchange or polarity. As Joan Mitchell, the American abstract expressionist painter shown here in her studio said, I carry my landscapes around with me. I don't have to leave the studio to be in the landscape, says Shui Guang Chen, and here I can't resist sharing with you this image of a painting, one of a series of paintings he made in the wake of a studio fire that destroyed all of his work in 2009. This painting entitled Burnt, traveling amid streams and mountains, is perhaps the most explicit example of his conversation with the Chinese Shan Shui, uh, the landscape painting tradition. Shui renders the scorched remnants of a book on the Northern Song Dynasty painter Fan Quan. He lived from 960 to 1030 Common Era. The burnt page on whose masterpiece, Xi Shan Xing Lu Tu, is presented uppermost as the outer skin of a charred object whose singed and flaking feathered paper edges themselves evoke the rugged Jiantang mountain landscape of Fan's original long hanging scroll as if rendered in layered sepia washes. The burnt edge thus comprises the receding heights for which the remains of the printed illustration provide a tortured middle ground. The self-reflexive self -reflexive complexity of this image in its various interior and exterior dimensions is the real work of an artist who doesn't like being labeled a realist. For many years, um, the atelier or studio has in various forms provided a natural environment for visual art practice and tuition, as much in Europe as it has in the Shan Shui and literati traditions of Chinese painting. In the late Ming dynasty, artists and teachers were two types of literati. And the artist or scholar's studio provided a retreat from the world of officialdom and human society. The studio was a place of reflection and immersion in nature. It opened space for scholarship and art making, as described by Chen Jiru of Sun Jiang, a late uh, Ming dynasty literatus, writing in his book, Shu Hua Jin Tang. He writes, studio, clean table, that's the painting, cool breeze and beautiful moon, vase of flowers, tea, bamboo shoots, oranges and tangerines in season, between mountains and rivers, research, peace in the world. Um, the Chinese scholar studio was precisely this liminal peripheral space. Here in a detail, the Yong Qian reading painted in 1483 by Shen Zhou, now showing in Paris at the Musée Chenuxi. The mid 19th century Paris studio of Charles Glaire, the academic history painter and pupil of Angra, was the art school at which future Impressionist painters, including Claude Monet, uh, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, and Alfred Sisley studied. I think Whistler was his pupil for a while. And from which they ventured out into the landscape as a plein air outdoor studio. Painting not indoors from sketches, but outside in the open, directly onto canvas. Um, 
here is uh, John Singer Sargent's uh, 1855 painting, Monet painting by the edge of the wood. M Monet sought to reproduce experience, not just as a staged interior tableau construct, but by direct exposure to the world outside and his studio at Giverny in the north of Paris, as both a workshop and a garden, was the embodiment of this principle of art and life. The artist's studio, it seemed, could be both inside and outside. And this relationship between inside and outside the studio as both a physical and a mental space is strongly influenced by technological development. In Monet's case, this meant the invention of portable field easels constructed as box pallets with telescopic legs, which made plein air painting suddenly more practicable. And here you see the Boîte de Campagne from Le Franc Essy uh, in Paris, um, a design that hadn't really me hasn't really had not really changed. Uh, since Monet's time. <laughs> the development of cheap new synthetic oil pigments, such as French ultramarine, readily available from the 1880s as ready mixed oil pigment in paint tubes, created the technical framework for plein air painting. Without this new technology, the new dialectic of inside and outside, we would not have Impressionism. Oops, this slide should not be there. And here's, here now is uh, Renoir's 1873 canvas, Monet painting in his garden at Argenteuil. The image of the artist painting outdoors became in itself a recurring motif for painters. And the plan air movement in turn presented a radical challenge to the art academies across Europe and North America and to the practice of painting. Perhaps a global phenomenon such as the novel coronavirus pandemic can be seen to present a similar scale of challenge to the art academy. COVID-19 and the long march of digital culture pose equally far-reaching questions regarding the studio as the place of art practice and tuition and the very nature of the art school experience. The dynamics of inside outside the studio are now greatly extended in the technological dimension through digital making and online communication, instantaneous online communication where the plan air movement moved the studio outside the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 locked it down again um, the artist studio evolved rapidly throughout the 19th and 20th centuries through technical technological developments in photography and moving image and digital image making <clears throat> into the photographic studio the film studio the music room has evolved into a recording studio. The emergence of portable digital technologies has transformed the scope and extent of the studio environment as a distinctive locus of creative energy and art making within a more open and discursive transcultural global visual culture. We can make and distribute work anywhere on the go, in the traffic of various kinds, on the street. The studio is a making space, a place of reflective practice across diverse, mutual, techno technical, technological, virtual, imaginal, philosophical, and spiritual dimensions. The studio is a mental, and a physical place of windows and doors 
and thresholds on the world of, and of human imagination. The studio can be sited in the art school, in the student's bedroom, or in the garden shed. The studio can move about online. It can do its work in the landscape or in the city centre. The studio can be in the refugee camp or on the road. The studio is by turns and at the same time, a workshop, a laboratory, a kitchen and a performance space. The studio is a place of looking and listening and thinking in the space of contemplation, crossing tactile, sonic and visual dimensions. The studio is a social and discursive place of networks and languages with wide ranging communication and reference horizons. The studio is a kind of living archive. Hybrid teaching and learning, so-called, analog and digital, face-to-face, -face, online, on campus, at home, synchronous and asynchronous. The concept of the extended studio, multiple reference horizons, all of these factors have transformed the internal and external contexts for the studio as the space of learning in art education. So in our emergent mid-pandemic world of increasingly hybrid art school experience, what is it that now reconstitutes the classroom as an extended studio? And where else might the studio be located? Where does the studio end and the world begin these days? In what ways does the world enter the studio? And in what different ways might the studio venture outward into the world? And if the space of learning offers or withdraws the possibility of learning, what do we wish to take forward? And what leave behind? What new possibilities does this extended hybrid studio hold for art teachers and artists? The studio, equally at home in the academic, digital and domestic spaces it occupies, is consistently, however, a mental space. It is the space of human imagination and of perception, a state of contemplation through materials and processes. I carry my landscapes around with me, as Joan Mitchell said. I don't have to leave the studio to be in the landscape, as Shui Gong Chun put it. The organizing principle here is that space does not, cannot contain energy because it is energy that creates space. The studio is thus this kind of emanation of the en en energies with which the artists occupy that space, wherever that space may choose to locate itself. Thank you. Thank you so much for this inspiring uh, presentation. Um, so we have a little bit of time for any any questions that immediately arise. We have um, we have time as well in the in the panel later on. But if anybody uh, would like to ask Andrew some questions, uh, then people are most welcome to just uh, ask, some, ask something now and then, or, or, or wait for the panel. It's all up to you. So um, this is a very inspiring presentation. Uh, so what are your recommendations? I mean, I know you gave a fantastic direction to everyone, uh, but what are your recommendations uh, moving on from this? I mean, I, I think um, I think this, this has been a, a moment, as it were, a kind of turning point, the experience that everybody's been through um, over the last 18 months or something. And um, 
what, what that has involved for me um, sitting in this room for quite a large part of the time is 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 the sort of things that I think I I've tried to get into the into the presentation today just reflections on on what space is on on the particularly on this question of inside and outside um, and so it's not a prescription <laughs> I think first and foremost these are <laughs> these are personal reflections and they um, but but what they they also um, seem to you know, indicate is um, the degree of the d degree to which our, our connectedness is not just by virtue of the technology it's profoundly is deeply cultural and you don't have to look very far to to see that um, uh, and and I, I think I think this is this is worth thinking about really it's worth reflecting on okay fantastic we have a question from uh, Balvir is art design um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering how to respond to that really, because, um, because these are kind of categories, hmm. um, uh, pigeonholes, if you like, um, <laughs> and and what I would be very wary of is the the degree to which categories limit thinking or or limit creative practice. Hmm. Um, so this is a this is a question that is often rehearsed, and it's it's. Um, on the other hand, there are different modes of imagination that I think um, we've understood for for a long time. And the English Romantic poet uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, in his literary autobiography *Biographia Literaria*, um, talked about these two kinds of imagination, the first of which he called primary imagination. Um, I think the word, the term he used for the second uh, was fancy, which is a contraction of the word fantasy. But in essence, what he was describing was one kind of imagination we called fancy, which is technical, is learned, uh, is uh, are about invention uh, you, you could call it design in a way uh, insofar as it depends upon experience it dep this kind of imagination is a trajectory that depends upon prior ex and builds upon prior experience whereas primary imagination is something much closer to what you might call perception you know, it doesn't depend on prior experience. You know, it, where it comes from, we never, we can't say for sure. But um, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, that the words art and design as, as kind of inroads into the bigger question of human imagination. But mm. thanks for that question. Fantastic. Ben is asking about, uh, uh, can you say more about pedagogy? Um, I, I, th the, in, in, the, in this, um, in this presentation, I really focused on the space of learning, but, but I guess there's, it's difficult to separate the, the environment from, you know, what's occurring as it were. And from a pedagogical from a pedagogical point of view, um, it, it seems to me that the studio is worth really thinking carefully about. From a pedagogical point, as as a very distinctive kind of learning environment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in a context in which arts spaces at an increasing premium in art schools, studios don't necessarily. Yeah exist in the way that they did hot desking is a phenomenon um what do you lose uh in those terms um and how do you get it how do you get it back um 
So, and the social dimension that I think um, I've kind of has been implicit in what I've been saying this morning, also really significant from a pedagogical uh, point of view. So Penny's question raises all sorts of um, uh, serious questions in my mind about the nature of a modular curricula and the nature of assessment regimes. Mm -hmm. um, and we could spend the rest of the morning uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, Penny and I will find another time. Um, of course, of course. Continue. Of course. Yeah. Okay, we have two more questions. This mm. can you see the one on the screen? I can. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. This is one from Susanna. The the software platforms that we use, uh, including this one, <clears throat> um, but you know, typically Zoom and and so on and so forth, weren't built for studio practice. Um, they were effectively built for business conferencing um, and then uh, customized for personal uh, communication and, and whatnot. And I, I'd be very interested to see what some, a platform like this or how close a platform like this could get to the experience of a live studio. That's to say... <laughs> interactive in 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 a way zoom zoom is a kind of illusion in in zoom there is the illusion of eye contact <laughs> you know and that's very different to the real thing and it kind of it zoom conditions our com habits of communication in ways that um you know the studio needs to be uh, less well behaved and uh, um, a bit more chaotic uh, than Zoom uh, allows. Okay, Absolutely. so the, the next question on the the coldness of the screen. It's such a such a fundamental question. This from Gonzalo and and um, I. I think the key to it really is is interaction that um you know we're, we're so used to sort of sitting in front of screens passively you know what the screen do is it locks you into that chair that you might be sitting in and you can't move uh, and and that's a, a nightmare for many people and yes um, <coughs> when i would i when I was at school, I couldn't keep still for more than 15 minutes, and that was a real problem. But sitting in front of a screen, it must be torture. Um, so interaction and making, how do, how do making processes e emerge? How can you perform um, dialogic making processes in the course of uh, a meeting such as this? Interesting question. Fantastic. Oh, thank you ever so much for for this um, contribution. This, uh, this has been really, really wonderful. And so stay on uh, down here in, in, the, in, in the recording studio for the panel, which is going to be in uh, three. Thank, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank okay, you so thanks. much. Okay, so it's been an intense morning. Uh, lots of um, uh, communication in, in the chat. So I think that uh, now is the panel, so it's up to you to ask questions or of each other or what's happened so far. I think this was the uh, the impulse behind the question I asked at yesterday's session, um, in, in, where I asked the panel to reflect on 
possible negative impacts of uh, academia on art and design. And um, I mean, I've worked in art schools for 25 years and the point at which I went back into academia from after 10 years working in the glass industry, um, what I encountered was, I don't know, third generation modularity, which seemed utterly inimical to creative practice. It was this kind of different, different rhythm altogether. Now, I know that a lot, a lot has developed since then, but I can't help thinking that the academization of art and design practice, you know, it's brought all kinds of benefits in terms of um, certain kinds of research and, and so forth. Um, but it's not entirely benevolent. And I think the point I've made in the chat is, is that design isn't a subject, art is not a subject. Um, there isn't a subject to hide behind. Uh, you know, you're not working at arm's length. You're, you're absolutely the focus of the activity. It's a performance. Um, n not, not many, uh, you know, not many subjects in higher education work in quite that way. Uh, I'd be interested in Frank's view of that because I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I, I thought. I thought Jan and, and Kai's presentations also absolutely in the moment uh, in terms of uh, the debate that we're having. So thanks to all of you for those, but, but maybe that's an open question. I spent my time during the talk actually asking questions of myself as I was going through it and thinking, I'm steering, I'm going in the wrong path, I'm going off at a direction, etc. Then I suddenly realized that actually that's what my career has been as a designer and what I end up experiencing. Um, it's, it's such a strange profession, whatever you want to call it, calling, profession, activity, performance. Uh, I, I still don't know what it is. Um, I'm still going to try and find out over the coming decades um what what, I, what it is that i'm actually doing and the difficulty is i think is that when we can't articulate as designers what we are doing it makes it incredibly difficult for us to put any structure towards showing anybody or holding anybody's hand to take them on that journey it, uh, I, it is a difficult thing to articulate um it, it's an easy thing to do for designers but it's an incredibly difficult thing to articulate is somebody, somebody going to pick up on answering that <laughs> from Susanna <laughs> I mean, I'll have a go. I, I think I think this is a really, um, really good question. And what it is that ethics involves is not just theory, but practice. It's it's about behaviour. It's about what you do. And I take Susanna's point about research ethics, and uh, which is you know, very properly in academic terms, codified and, and observed and necessary. Um, but ethics in relation to creative practice um, is, a, is about what, how you act. It's about right action. <laughs> uh, um, Carrie has his hand up. Yeah. I have been discussing recently with many design schools and leaders of many design schools when mapping the needs. And I've noticed that there is the new trend for ethical design, uh, food design, thinking of bigger picture, how we can uh, have the, the food uh, sufficiently 
organized, how, to, how they were designed the food delivery, the food um, uh, from growing to the uh, feeding the, the, the poor ones is one thing. Sustainable design, it's very, very, very ethical at this moment. Green design, all these items which are now coming as a new big things, uh, designers are trying to solve some big problems. And I think it's very much linked to the ethics. Also, from my point of view, in the intellectual property uh, office, we, we are kind of promoting these ethical, uh, ethical standards. And uh, yeah, it's something we should maybe discuss further. Uh, I have a comment on that, <clears throat> because I'm sometimes surprised by this kind of new discovery of uh, sustainability in design and sustainable design and it it ties a bit back to um, uh, your observation before on, on uh, the RCA's initial mission of being designed as a commercial driver uh, that then have been has been criticized by um, by figures such as uh, Victor Papanek or nowadays maybe Arturo Escobar could be uh, one of these uh, figures uh, criticizing um, yeah similar approaches on a, on a global level um, but I think some uh, or at least for me personally one important figure in design history that has been drastically overseen is Tomas Maldonado um, the former and last director of the Ulm School of Design in Germany in the late 50s and Tomas came uh, to Europe uh, in the 50s to, from Argentina and, and he was the one actually <laughs> starting off arguing with uh, Max Bill at the time, uh, the director of the Ulm School, um, who, of course, kind of brought, being a former Bauhaus student, brought in a lot of um, uh, of Gropius uh, thoughts and thinking into the Ulm School as well. And uh, Maldonado was the one to question that heavily because uh, uh, he was convinced, and I must say <laughs> that was a fair observation that you uh, you couldn't uh, compare post-war Europe uh, to the Europe of the um, yeah uh, of 1918 and so forth, uh, and he was actually the one coming up and, uh, and I really recommend reading his text from the 50s and then later on with the social notion uh, of design pretty early on and and the social responsibility that designers hold and that was long that was I mean. Uh, 20 years before Papanek even turned up uh, with his critique of the design of design for the real world. So um, I am really sometimes surprised how this this nowadays becomes this great discovery. And by the way, I must say my critique about Escobar, who is like promoting this thinking a lot uh, in these days in his writings, he didn't even cite Maldonado in no, none of his books. Uh, I'm really surprised how and why this is a this sort of big discovery. It's been there all the time, uh, pretty much all the time. It's uh, of course there is periods where um, the commercial aspect or employability have been articulated a bit more compared to other factors, but uh, the social responsibility and the responsibility that nowadays uh, uh, and by social I would refer to. Um, uh, to social, uh, um, to entities, both human entities and non-human entities, so referring a bit to actor network the theory here, uh, the social responsibility of design and designers has been there from the very first beginning. So uh, uh, I disagree a bit here. Like uh, for me, that is, uh, it's, it's neither a new discovery nor it's something that we need to add. It, it, it needs to be re-articulated maybe because it, it, it it's, it's been in the background maybe for some years. I like the question about shall we have more fun in class? I mean, that's, that's an exciting one because I, I, when Andrew was speaking, I was looking at the pictures of the studio and the paint everywhere and the mess. And it just makes me think that when I now go to institutions and go to their, their studios, their, their rooms, etc., they're so pristine, they're so clean. You, you can't make a mess because it's probably uh, X million pounds of European funding that's created a beautiful floor and the architects have done it and the interior design has been in there, etc. But you cannot mess it up. And I think this is something that's really been lost, especially 
I mean, my experience mainly in terms of the UK, you go into what were art schools, which were probably very old Victorian buildings, and you could splash paint around, you could hammer nails into the floor, you could make a mess. And now you can't, you virtually are in a sterile environment. And I think that that really is a bit of an issue. And and Andrew's presentation of the studio um, really brought that home to me is I don't see that anymore. In, in, in design studios in, in universities. Absolutely. Disagree here, I must say. <laughs> it cannot be applied to any situation. Uh, I hardly, I really disagree here. And maybe I'm, 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 I'm stating this also on the purpose of provocation here. <laughs> I see a lot of graduates struggling uh, to find even or acquire the vocabulary to communicate with non-designers. So, no. Uh, uh, as a design educator, I don't see our students and learners being educated to apply the mental models or their toolkit to any situations. I think this is something we really fall short of in many, many places. There are good examples, of course. That's why I said I'm, I'm kind of uh, overemphasizing this. But I think we need to be aware that... Um, uh, there, there is something missing in our current tool or skill uh, set that is being taught at, at schools of arts and design all around the world and that uh, would establish this connection or this kind of uh, transferability of knowledge. And, and, uh, and it's not an easy thing. That's what other disciplines are struggling with too. Can I uh, just respond to Penny's question on the screen, which uh, is also in a way my uh, answer to Gonzalo's question for all of us to identify one critical challenge for design and what would that be? And, and I, think, um, I think the answer to Gonzalo's question is very much about sustainability and, and diversity. It has to do with the great big the big issues, questions of our time, but um, but as a design assignment for today, I think it's to redesign the studio as a post-institutional space. I, I, I would add in terms of sustainability, I, I, I've yet and I struggle to find a, a, a good enough definition of sustainability for, for, for myself. Um, I think one of the critical things is designers must must uh, engage in discussion, in debate, in a wider context to understand the meanings of sustainability, not just to accept sustainability, but to be able to argue for sustainability, to be able to articulate what it means. I struggle with it. I, uh, for, for me, one of the most sustainable things as an example moving forward was the fourth road bridge where you started painting it and by the time you got to the end of it um, you needed to, to to start painting it again um, that was sustainable for jobs um, and, and employment and sustainable society uh, had they have had sustainable paint at the time the jobs would have gone um, so I think there's you know there are issues that designers need to come to terms with in terms of how they articulate how they argue and, and and debate and i find sometimes it's very difficult to engage in wider conversation with design students other than a narrow definition of design uh you know one of the things i always say is stop stop just reading design magazines and pick up magazines pick up science magazines pick, pick up a harvard business review pick up hey, whatever you know material science magazine just get 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 out of design. But the the, the more we do it, the, 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 the more convergent and narrower it, it becomes. And the profession has some issues to deal with itself in this direction. I mean, we struggle at the society with this, how, how, how we actually widen the scope for debate and whether it's possible to widen the scope for debate. Um, you, in the current world in which we live, uh, a lot of debate is being closed down 
rather than being opened up. Um, and, and these are political issues as much as anything else. Um, uh, so I think critical issue for design, designers must start talking, but they, in order to do that and articulate, they must know how to think philosophically. Maybe in response to the question, ah, oh, sorry, no, jump in. <laughs> sorry, uh, Carrie, but Susanna was asking me to elaborate on the studio as a post-institutional space, and um, I think that what that comment reflects uh, a long-standing concern that the very notion of a subject of, of the subject becomes an impediment to learning. Um, at various points in terms of creative practice and yet so much is invested in the notion of subject you know curriculum design and validation contracts of employment um, institutional hierarchy and so on and so forth and and I also think that what's happening what's been happening in the UK for a uh, quite some considerable time is a distortion of the purpose of learning. Um, what I think of as the uh, hostile takeover of the education system by the assessment industry. So that actually the exam factory is 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 the thing that is kind of driving behavior and managerial decision making, as well as funding shortages and whatnot. And I guess you would probably know that you would know that you were in a post institutional space when you started thinking differently in those terms without those kinds of um, constraints or or distortions. That's um, not a comprehensive answer, answer, but at least it stretches the uh, the question a bit further. So fantastic. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, ah, just maybe two notions I've seen uh, sustainability popping up in the comments and the term sustainability. And as sometimes I ask myself, what is it really that we want to sustain <laughs> if we take a look at the mess all around us? So um, there I see. Uh, Personally, I prefer uh, talking of a uh, transition, and I think there is also at Carnegie Mellon currently the, the term of transitional or transition design being coined, which I think is a really interesting one, or uh, at least an, a more suitable uh, term compared to sustainability. Um, and then there was a question in between somewhere, like what is um, the key challenge or the key, the core thing that we should uh, address in, in, in design or education? Um, and I think um, when you said, uh, is design education too important to leave it entirely to design educators, which kind of ties back to, <laughs> I think it was Tim Brown saying, is design too important to leave it to designers? And I must say, yes, I agree, because I see that that being exactly the, the, the core challenge here. As designers um, uh, or educating designers, we fall short to educate them to, again, communicate and collaborate with non-designers, which is most of our planet's <laughs> human population. So, uh, yes, I, I totally agree here. We need to bring on, in other competences, other people, um, and the same way they might be struggling to come into design education uh, the same way we are struggling when whenever we engage with other fields sometimes. So I think that kind of area of friction needs to be actually uh, taken advantage of to, you know, um, to free some new and emerging uh, pedagogies, approaches, uh, critique, uh, and, and much more. I think one of the other challenges as well, and, and, and Carrie obviously is working in this area, is the own, is, it becomes how designers understand the ownership of ideas, the ownership uh, of, of things created or the shared ownership of, of, of things created. And I think, I think moving forward, that's going to be a really um, critical issue within the design profession. 
um, because we we often you know talk about the, the intellectual property is the currency of design. Um, it, it, it's what you can actually transfer and, and get a value from. But with so much now that is free, is open source, um, and, and that's the, the the, the sort of a democratic uh, route that, that one goes down. It makes it, uh, Carrie, I'm going to be interested now to hear what you say to that. Uh, you're on mute, you're on mute, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have had a very interesting discussion about exactly the same subject with the European uh, University Association. Um, uh, there are two things. Um, there is, um, education and awareness about the possibilities. And this is what we do in our, our project. We are trying to provide information on, for young, young artists, young designers, young writers, that uh, if you are thinking of continuing this part, uh, want to make a living on this, there are these options. Um, let's say that uh, from the university point of view, um, very many universities are using the intellectual property um, registration uh, as an index of that we are in innovative university. Uh, it's kind of indexation. And it's a little bit contradictory, I have to admit. But the point is that if a young designer knows that I can put my things on the open uh, common creatives, and I can have my name mentioned every time my, my idea, my design is uh, uh, used by other. It's all right. If somebody wants to register it and try to uh, profit somehow out of it, uh, students should be informed about that. What are the options? What are the possibilities? And when we are speaking about intellectual property education, this is the one we want to promote creativity, innovation and boost young people to to know what are their options and uh, from that angle it doesn't seem so contradictory at the same moment the european union is boosting on open um, open uh, science uh, approach it's coming more and more and it's linked to the kind of how science research are published and they are very often hidden by behind the pay, uh, paywalls and that's a totally other business but it's an interesting area um, but I would encourage everybody to 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 learn the basics of IP in order to make a kind of a intelligent choice how they are using uh, their innovation or their design so that's the point That could be an extended discussion, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> discussion of ownership. I was just thinking in, in, in a, a post-Bartese uh, scenario, who doesn't really own things anymore? I mean, and Bartes wrote that piece of text, what is it now, 70 years ago. Um, uh, but but uh, there's a nice quote that come in, it comes into my mind by Italian composer Luciano Berio. And there was a fantastic documentary on his work. Um, unfortunately, I think it, it, it got lost somewhere on YouTube and so, or something. It's hard to find it. So Luciano Berio being that um, experimental composer. And um, there was one fantastic scene in that documentary where he sits uh, in, an, in a rehearsal room with a percussionist and reads out the, the score of, 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 his, of the piece that he has written, which is mainly consisting of words, not of notes. And the percussionist, uh, the drummer, starts to interpret that. So the question is, who owns the piece at that moment? And uh, Luciano Berio is being asked that question at the very end of, of the documentary. Uh, are you afraid uh, whenever you write a piece and hand it over to let's say a group of people performing it, an orchestra, and, and he says not at all because um, there is no such thing that would exist without anything else existing or any entity existing before. And re he refers to his way of composing and creating as a way of a journey uh, that kind of uh, moves on each and every time his pieces are being reinterpreted um, or recreated. And I think this relates to a lot of things that we do nowadays as designers too, especially when it comes 
uh, to the collectiveness of uh, of what could be called project making when referring to Mancini. So um, I see ownership, even if it's kind of having a, a quite a recent revival with within the digital world with NFTs uh, and so forth. Uh, this is sure one of the terms that I would criticize most in, within the design context. Um, this is a massive question, Susanna. Uh, and I, I think the, in an institutional context, the, the answers to that probably come from outside <laughs> rather than can be found inside. Um, and the, the, the something that we haven't really focused on in this morning's session, which but but which is part of the studio in a way, <clears throat> um, and certainly material to this debate is the whole question of dialogue, and I mean genuine dialogue, not the sim the transactional exchange of already existing points of view. Um, so in dialogue, in dialogue where where you, in true dialogue where you, where there is no um, preconceived uh, agenda or outcome for a conversation, the conversation is allowed to develop itself, and um, that can take you into a space that is completely free of the kinds of constraints that we all we all find. Uh, to a degree unbearable uh, from time to time. And, and um, I suppose, the, I suppose the, the kind of dark thing I'm saying is that I'm not sure that fighting the institution would lead to a happy ending <laughs> uh, because it's bigger than you are. And uh, it's very set in its ways. Um, I don't mean your institution, I mean the institution. Um, and a little bit like that quote from Stuart Brand on, in, on architectural institutions, they don't like change. So fi finding um, a community uh, of practice or um, a, a series of conversations that take you out of that space and into a different space can feed the work that you do um, within the institution and it will also connect you to other people um, within the, the institution that feel exactly the same way that you do. Absolutely. I think, the, I, I think it's so important that designers don't stop fighting I mean, I think designers have to fight. They, they 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 fight almost every day to justify what it is that they do or to explain what they do. And that fight is an incredibly internal fight, um, you know, grappling with what it is, what it is that makes you a, a designer. The fact that you can, can you actually, can you interact with other people who are not designers? Um, it, it, it's just a way of thinking. It's a way of life that... I can really put a lot of people off to be quite honest in terms of if you're a designer when you're there being so nerdish about things when you're there discussing the details or somebody somebody says something you think no there's a there's a better way to do it you can become incredibly contradictory in, in, in terms of other people I, th I think it's it's something I find I, I struggle with in, in in terms of saying no my 
my way uh, is is a way I've thought about. I've been thinking about it so long. I've got it right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then how you how you actually work with other people to convince them. And it, but you really are fighting all the time to 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 actually put a stake in the ground to say these are my views. This is what I'm. This is what I'm thinking. That's interesting. And again, I think that's not something that is an exclusively limited to designers. No. Maybe the different is the difference is that we used to deal with a lot of everyday things that we have in common with other people too, be it a physical artifact, a digital environment, or whatever it is. So we are concerned about these things that are to be found in other people's lives too. Uh, I think, you know, a computer scientist, uh, someone working in machine learning is as nerdish as we are <laughs> or nerdy as we are in, in his or her kind of context. It's just that um, it rarely happens that we, we discuss these matters because they're not to be found maybe yet uh, um, in our daily lives to a certain extent as, as design does in, in, in many ways. But I think I was interested in, in, in your presentation where you put create at the center and then you put to the foresight to foresee. I think that is that's a particular thing about design is the scenario planning that goes on mm -hmm. inside your head all the time C can go a lot faster than somebody who's not, not not trained in that respect, but doesn't have that design approach. And it, that puts, is you out, it puts you out of sync at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. There is, we're, we're reaching the end of the session, right? No, I mean, I mean, no, no. I mean, Carrie, Carrie has not. Uh, I feel that Carrie wants to say something, and uh, we have, we have gone over. Yeah, we've gone over six <laughs> minutes so far, but yeah, but it's so it's really engaging and interesting, and I feel so I feel so bad of, of, about cutting it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that the period of COVID has been very difficult for many professions, and I'm I'm dealing a lot with teachers and. Um, the recent studies made in the, by the, among the teachers are showing that quite many are totally over, uh, exhausted by the, the, the problem of uh, either being distance teaching, face-to-face -face teaching, hybrid teaching, and you have to have a different approach in everything. But there are a lot of other professions where people are feeling exhausted. And um, you have all my sympathy, Susanna, um, I think that each individual who are feeling exhausted should look for help, uh, not from designers, but from um, experts on that. And this is my, my, my thing, what I want to say. I think, I think the first line of resistance is not to, is to try not to internalize the institution. Um, you know, don't let it, don't let it in. Um, and if you, if you manage to do that, then you won't become institutionalized. And um, that's probably the easiest way of saying something that is actually a very difficult and complex <laughs> balancing act and juggling act and just about every other circus uh, act uh, that you like to name um but um you know the the biggest risk is is isolation and i think to come back to what uh, Kyrie was saying that is one of the most damaging um effects of the pandemic uh lockdown was that so many people found themselves um utterly isolated um uh but having networks having conversations like this is you know what left terrace has put together over the course of these two days um you know people will be drawing energy uh from this and i'll keep it going uh, for a while until also we have many conversations of design education talks podcast 60 episodes yeah. on all these matters so people can also go to that for for encouragement and uh analysis I mean, I really don't want to, to uh, end this uh, panel uh, unless somebody has anything else to add. Uh, would you like to take a half an hour break or a 40-minute break? Half an hour gets us up to our time. 
or 40 minutes gets us just over 10 minutes over our time. What What's better for everyone, you think? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do half an hour? Yeah. Make a decision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do half an hour because that's the only break we're having. And then because we're finishing the conference and then there's the workshop at the end, which you've all received information for four. So you'd also like to register for that. There's only 18 places in that workshop. All, all the participants have received. I sent an email this morning to all the participants. So if, if it's of, of interest to you, there's only 18 places. Uh, and we, yeah, and we continue the conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a real pleasure having all of you. A fantastic, uh, fantastic mix of. Uh, thank you so views. much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.